Hello, my name is Gerard van der Horst. I'm from Cape Town in South Africa, and uh, I'm very privileged uh, that you've invited me to um, present this paper at your Inland University in Norway. And um, I uh, just want to, before I start off with my first slide, just want to indicate um, that I have tried to present some really interesting material, mm, some interesting mammals uh, in terms of wildlife, uh, even some birds, and also uh, even insects. So I've tried to make it not too technical, not too many graphs, not too many data. So let us then get uh, going with the first slide. Uh, so my association is with the University of the Western Cape, and uh, I'm particularly associated with the Comparative Spermatology Group, and um, I'm a senior consultant to Microptic. So let's start uh, from the very beginning. And as I call it, this is where my story begins with the black-footed ferret. Uh, this animal was formally declared extinct in about 1960. And uh, then in 1983, a miracle happened. And uh, this is in Wyoming uh, in the United States uh, on, the farm in, on a farm in Matitsi. A dog turned up with an animal in its mouth. An animal that's supposed to be extinct, it was a black-footed ferret. And when the person took it to, the farmer took it to the taxidermist, he told him, you're in big trouble, you're not allowed to even have this close by if you find one. And so the Wyoming Wildlife Service was called in and they immediately lodged a search, found 200 of these animals um, near Matitsi. Uh, this is the Matitsi area, high up in the mountains. Uh, in Wyoming, but then unfortunately disaster struck. So there was canine and distemper, and in the end they could only capture 13 of these animals. Uh, why did these numbers decline so rapidly in terms of the black-footed ferret? Their only prey is uh, prairie dogs. And the farmers believed that uh, you had to poison the holes because the cattle would break their legs in the, uh, in the holes of the prairie dogs. And that is, of course, been proven to be total nonsense. But they have killed hundreds of thousands of prairie dogs. In the end, no food for the, uh, for the black-footed ferret that was so selective in terms of what it eats. So uh, these 13 animals were then kept in a phenomenal facility at uh, Seville, uh, just outside um, Laramie at the University of Wyoming. And um, we had access to these animals to do electroejaculation under sedation conditions and study their sperm on a monthly basis, record it and do various studies on it. And this is just to show you in the black-footed ferret, uh, initially vast abnormalities, uh, which was partly inbreeding, which was partly associated with the beginning of the season, like lipped, as you can see here, the lipped acrosomes, um, and also here, DAG defect, bent mid-pieces, and so forth. We also did CASA, computer-aided sperm analysis, where we compared actually three ferret species, uh, four ferret species apart, the black-footed ferret, the Siberian ferret, the Fitch ferret, and the domestic ferret. And we have done a CASA analysis where we could follow sp uh, the sperm tracks, in each of the species, and there were no differences. The only differences that could be found was um, uh, in different media, but then they reacted the same in a particular medium. This was, for example, equine extender, where we had a vast number of hyperactivation occurring, essential for fertilization to take place. And this is a very interesting uh, aspect, where we have actually found that the acrosome is an indication of species specificity, the, how it looks like. This is in the domestic ferret, where there's a smooth posterior border of the acrosome. Here it is like scalloped, but very thick lips of the scalloping. And this is the Fitch ferret, which is um, a hybrid between the domestic ferret and uh, the Siberian ferret. And this is the black-footed ferret, then, which has this very, very distinct scalloped um, posterior acrosome. And this is a, a slide that I'm not going to go into the details, except to tell you that from this we could derive nine, the nine founder males, and we were fortunate to study the sperm characteristics of, according to the entire population. So uh, this is our Wyoming sperm crew that worked from 1988 
to 2009 on this project. And of course, we were just a very small part of this really huge program um, uh, of uh, conservationists, ecologists, etc., uh, endocrinologists. Uh, and, uh, but there are now fortunately about 3,000 black-footed ferrets uh, in many zoos across the United States. And they have even released these animals in their controlled, uh, controlled release in the original homing areas. So this is fantastic news. And due to also the efforts of crowd preserving the sperm and actually producing uh, also pups by insemination. By 2009, we have written this paper um, where we have actually compared the sperm characteristics over season and in terms of cryopreservation preservation and physiological extender. Uh, for the uh, for the four ferret species and i think the important thing that came out of this is that you can use any of these species as a surrogate for the others for example let's say the f uh, in the end there was only one female of black-footed ferret uh, remaining then she could have been inseminated with sperm um, from another uh, from for example siberian ferret which is the closest and that is of course not ideal but at least you uh, you trap some of the important genes Let's go over now to the carnivores. And we were very fortunate to have access to a whole range of carnivores. As you know, in Africa, you have the big cats. Um, and um, with the first one we started with is the African lion. And here is an ideal situation where it was possible to do not only sedation of these lions, but to do ultrasonography and also to do a uh, collect sperm through a very special technique called urethral um, uh, uh, catheterization. We use a dark catheter, and as you can see, with ultrasonography, we could easily follow the catheter and uh, pass the bladder so that we could collect sperm here in the prostatic urethra. Uh, we used medetomidine, uh, alpha-2 uh, agonist, so it was easy to actually have contraction of the vast deference and could collect a lot of sperm from that almost from that area. And, um, and of course, the ketamine is a, a, re a relatively mild uh, anesthetic. So what else did we do? We had also then access to Bengal tigers, African leopards, and a whole range of others, wild dog, cheetah, and so forth. And the one interesting finding here uh, in terms of a wildlife application uh, is that when you look, for example, at the kinematic parameters of lion, Bengal tiger, and leopard, uh, you will see that there are great overlaps. And you can also see from the tracks. Uh, these are all rapid-moving sperm, uh, of course, in a, co a consistent medium. And we have also published this work um, in the last year in animals. Let's move over to elephants. Uh, and it may be surprising for you to hear that uh, we uh, engaged on a major project on elephant contraception, male elephant contraception. People all over the world talk about African elephant being endangered. In South Africa, it is certainly not endangered. There are too many elephants and it actually has to be controlled. And one of the best humane ways to do it is by darting. And we have actually managed after we have studied sperm characteristics in detail, to be able to apply uh, uh, the relevant uh, contraceptive. And uh, in order to do this, you need a really big team, helicopter to dart the elephants from the air. Once the elephant uh, is sedated, you must work very fast. You have about 45 minutes before you need to actually uh, let the elephant free again. And um, uh, so, uh, we had this fantastic team, and once the sperm were collected by means of, um, first of all, pulling the front piece of the penis out, we call these guys the penis pullers, back, and you have to do this very quickly, otherwise the elephant withdraws the tip of the penis into the sheath, and you can never get it out again. So uh, we use uh, ster uh, sterile plastic bags as a condom, and immediately after collection, uh, we start processing under field conditions. The sample is then subsequently uh, sent via helicopter to our lab, to our field lab, which is fully, fully uh, have all the required equipment. But before I come to that, 
What about elephants in different conditions? What about must? I didn't have a good picture of an African elephant in must, but here you can see must means that there's uh, oily secretions from these oil glands. Uh, and usually in the, uh, under these conditions, the elephants are, have very high levels of testosterone. They are very aggressive. And they are also the ones that have the high sperm concentration. And we surmise that those are really the ones that often would actually copulate to the females. Look at an African elephant that is really aggressive, and it can be a really big problem. And here you can see at one of our big game reserves, uh, somebody have managed to capture this uh, amazing situation where the elephant was really little, uh, rather playing with the car. And um, yes, under conditions like these, the particular contraceptive that we used uh, would also inhibit, of course, testosterone and uh, would, uh, would help with this kind of behavior. So uh, we also sampled sperm from semi-captive uh, African elephants. And here we used a very ingenious technique developed by some top-class vets where we do standing sedation of an African elephant. So it is sedated sufficiently uh, not to react negatively to prostatic massage. Uh, and here you can see this prostatic massage taking place after ultrasonography, uh, ultrasonography has been uh, uh, performed to see that all the organs are uh, uh, nicely intact and healthy. And uh, once the prostatic uh, massage starts, the uh, penis becomes erect and you can sample anything from 10 to about 200 milliliters of semen from a single elephant. And you can see it can have different colors, uh, which is usually related to the diet of these elephants. I don't want to bombard you with an enormous amount of information, but uh, we have done very intensive and very detailed computer-aided uh, sperm analysis, where we did some 100 sperm parameters for motility and morphology alone. And this is some of the data over two seasons. And um, Again, a very busy diagram, and I'm not going to bother you too much with it. A, a paper that we've published, uh, Dr. Ilse Litter, that uh, was initially a PhD student under the supervision of Dr. Liana Maria and myself. And uh, uh, over two seasons, we have found that the best sperm quality is over, in this instance, the rainy season, and that, um, uh, that, that also coincided with most of the cows being uh, in estrus. So while elephants don't have a, a particular season in which they breed, there is certainly a peak during the breeding season. So this is very interesting and it's all encaptured in this paper that we, that we wrote in Reproduction, Fertility and Development. So just to show you some of the other data that we uh, found, uh, this is supposed to be a video that I'm not going to play, it's, uh, it's a re a really a problem with webinars. But this is how the tracks look like. And you can see we have stimulated the sperm here with caffeine, 10 millimolar caffeine. And you can see uh, hyperactivation developing here. Uh, the higher the percentage of hyperactivation, the better is this, the higher is the quality of the sample because hyperactivation has been correlated with fertilization, positive fertilization outcome, and, and even live birth outcome. Let's move on to sea mammals, and they are quite difficult. But, you know, on the other hand, if you can train dolphins to do this, you can also train them to collect semen. And you can see in this instance, we have uh, trained the dolphins uh, to come to the trainer, turn upside down, and when you tap on, the, uh, tap on the tummy here, the penis comes out of the sheath, and you can collect up to 60 mils in a plastic bag. What was interesting, they like it so much they come back, and so we made use of that opportunity to collect sperm every 30 minutes. And what was very interesting, at least in terms of sperm motility, in terms of the percentage sperm motility, in terms of velocity, uh, all these parameters improve with the second and third ejaculates. And this is very important also in domestic animals. So you will actually get your best functional sperm in second and third ejaculates. Uh, uh, we have also shown that you, this could be done successfully in humans. Let's go over to goats. Goats, wild goats. Well, not totally wild, but these uh, are absolutely a unique group of goats, goats called tankwa goats. 
And um, you can see they are not only very beautiful, very diverse colors, but uh, they have actually been found after being isolated apparently for a period of 70 years. This is uh, the southern tip of South Africa. And just beyond the mountains is an area called the Tangpa National Park. It is extremely arid and dry. A very little rainfall, very high temperatures in summer, very low temperatures in winter. And so we've studied these goats um, over two seasons or so, and um, for over many years, and uh, under, under these fantastic conditions, having an air-conditioned van with uh, three labs inside it. And you can see here we've done CASA analysis. And here is our MSc student of uh, Dr. Liana Maria uh, uh, and myself, who uh, performed all the analyses. Uh, and um, I'm not going to bombard you with data, but again, the big differences in season. In the summer, we had the best, uh, best semen characteristics. I'm just indicating here volume and percentage motile sperm. Uh, then uh, furthermore, um, uh, we've managed to quantify a large number of these parameters. Also, hyperactivation. And um, this has all been uh, prepared in a paper. Uh, which uh, was again written by our MSU student, uh, uh, Asaneli, and uh, under the supervision of Dr. Marie and myself. We were at this stage interested uh, in terms of, um, uh, yes, we are following, in these studies, we are tracking the head. We are not tracking the tail. And so uh, this group from uh, University of Birmingham, a very famous group, a very brilliant group under the working uh, with uh, um, uh, Murich Gallagher, uh, Smith and Kirkman Brown, have developed a program called FAST, by, whereby you can study flagellar characteristics in detail. And we have applied this to Tangwa goats. And um, uh, very interesting, we could we could really study the flagellar parameters in very great detail and compare it to two-dimensional cost analysis, reconstruction of 2D tracks to 3D tracks, and relate it to flagellar parameters. We're busy preparing a paper on this, and we have some very interesting data here where we can measure the flagellar speed, the flagellar length, and we can even express the energy expenditure per sperm in what's so extremely sophisticated. And part of this work has been uh, uh, published uh, in animal reproduction science recently uh, by our group. The person that's been really instrumental in helping me with this is uh, Joanna Schlendak. You probably recognize her, a PhD student at your university. And uh, I'm very, very much indebted to her ingenious help in this context. Let's get over to the issue of monogamy. Uh, you know, in most uh, uh, animals, right across the spectrum, there is rather an issue of sperm competition to the highest level. So the animal with the best sperm uh, is usually the one that is most successful in terms of leaving offspring. But what about those where there is an absence of sperm competition? And uh, one would expect this in the situation of eusocial mammals. And there are only two species of eusocial, uh, eusocial mammals. One is the naked rodent mole. And here the female uh, selects one male for life. And uh, 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 you can see they, they barely have any hair. That's why they're called naked. And the female controls the entire colony. She has workers under her, uh, uh, males, and female workers, and she only selects one male for life. The rest of the animals are totally reproductively suppressed. Uh, and once she comes into estrus, uh, uh, she copulates with this male that she selected, like for 36 hours, and they do all kinds of sexual tricks. And uh, once she is pregnant, she carries as many as 24 pups. Can you believe that? Uh, the only one that can, 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 can leave offspring. Um, so let me show you some interesting things. Uh, this would represent pregnancy. That would represent the entire pregnancy of 70 days. And she can suppress the colony very effectively in terms of reproduction up to that point. But then uh, she is too big 
to really do this physically. And you will see in the next slide, while she managed to suppress spermatogenesis very effectively up till mid-pregnancy, from here on she cannot suppress uh, even her best mate, and spermatoze uh, spermatogenesis proceeds, and the best sperm arrived here during estrus. But um, it was a major job to find sperm. There are very few sperm, and they are vastly abnormal. Here... Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Liana Maria, and I studied these animals over a long time. We've written some four publications on this. And you can see that the spermophology relates to whew, extremely abnormal sperm. There's not one sperm <laughs> that looks normal. Uh, maybe that one. And you can see every sperm is vastly different. If you look at the scanning electron microscopy, nobody believed me. They said, no, 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 no. This is an artifact of preparation. It can't be that you find such a sperm. Yes, it is indeed. And when you do transmission electron microscopy, you find that they actually have vast areas of fragmentation. What is amazing is that in the female, there is amazing mechanisms to fix up this defective uh, chromatin. Of course, not all of it, but a large part of it. So, <clears throat> uh, this may be a normal sperm, but motility is extremely low. This is CASA. There is a motile sperm. Uh, uh, poorly moving one, and here almost non-progressive ones. The yellow crosses are immotile sperm, and no wonder that when you look at motility, there's only 8 to 15 percent motility, and morphology only 8 to 12 percent in the breeders. Interesting when you compare this to humans, which I also consider to be largely, uh, of course, um, only living in groups, in other words, monogamous, and. Um, uh, we were able to write this very interesting paper called Sperm Structure and Motility in the Eusocial uh, Naked Mole Rat Heterocephalus Graber, a case of degenerative orthogenesis in the absence of sperm competition. What does it mean? It actually means that sperm, actually in adaptation of not having any competition, uh, really becomes simplified up to a level where it is very, very abnormal, but it can still fertilize. And it's a very interesting situation that when we compare it to many other monogamous animals, we find the same kind of thing. That in the absence of sperm competition, sperm is usually of a useless quality, but uh, there is still success in terms of Im impregnating. <clears throat> Just very briefly in birds, you can fool an ostrich by making a huge, big artificial vagina, uh, and uh, uh, you can imprint on it so that you can actually analyze sperm, and here is again motile sperm analyzed. This is how the tracks look like in terms of rapid progressive movement, uh, medium progressive and non-progressive movement. And we could st uh, study this in very great detail. And these are some of the tracks. They said you can't produce hyperactivation in birds. Well, we have managed to do it with caffeine. And here you can clearly see in the ostrich hyperactivation. Let us move over to the bees. <coughs> And uh, just very, very briefly, um, you know, African bees um, are very vicious. So you have to put on the right clothing, not to get a bee in the bonnet. And, um, uh, and it's very easy to select drones. Uh, and uh, once we've selected drones, we can sample sperm from them. How do you do it? Well, you hold it very tight and you rub over the abdominal area and out jumps the reproductive organ of the, butt of the drone. And this is how we can show it diagrammatically, where this whole reproductive organ comes out. That hooks into the female reproductive system. The semen sits on top with some mucus there, and you can sample some one microliter of sperm. And very interesting what we've discovered. Uh, it's a pity I can't show you this video, but the sperm swim actually uh, in in a uh, he, uh, helix, and they do relay sperm swimming. In other words, sperm in the surrounding medium can actually join up with this, and join up with this, and um, uh, some sperm can again leave. And maybe it is good sperm that displaces sperm that are less good. And we found that the more you have these very intensive areas of extremely high helical motility, the better is the sperm quality. And we have actually now managed with uh, our bee research group, we call it Bee Crazy, 
um, to quantify the different categories uh, of sperm quality using CASA. This is quite difficult, but we've managed to do that. I don't have time to show you that, but very interesting. I would love to carry on and show you some more wildlife forms among the invertebrates. Um, suffice to just show you one example where you can sample sea urchin sperm by injecting them with about 5 millimolar of KCL and even less you can get as much as 2 milliliters of semen and uh, um, uh, in uh, the female the eggs are bright yellow and you can do fertilization experiments here the sperm also moves in very tight helix why would sperm prefer to swim in a helix and not progressively forward and that is, we figured out that the chances of meeting an egg with helical swimming is much higher than when you just swim straight. So very interesting, again, uh, understanding basic biology to be able to apply it when required. So I can end off by saying, uh, and I hope you've seen it here with the whole spectrum of animals, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, uh, nor the most intelligent but certainly those ones most responsive to change. And I think this is very, very wise words. A program like I've presented to you, which is all represent our own research, cannot be done without teamwork. And I am much indebted to this wonderful team. There is myself, uh, the lab director, uh, Dr. Liana Maria. There is a better picture of her. Um, uh, who keeps all of us sane and intact and organize the lab. And um, uh, so we're very much indebted to the whole group and our team leader. Uh, I also work in close conjunction with the University of Stellenbosch, just five minutes away, uh, under Professor Stefan Duplessis. He has, in the meantime, accepted a position in Dubai, where he is the Dean of Research at the New Medical University. But we still have close collaboration with him. Um, and these are all the very nice students and colleagues. The person that's been taking over the lab now is Dr. Bonkis Kozana, and uh, I hope to collaborate, keep on collaborating with her. Uh, finally, then, the, uh, just the acknowledgement in terms of, again, um, all the uh, role players that have provided funds or assisted in some other way. And I just need to indicate again, this is my main home, the Comparative Spermatology Group, and uh, I'm a senior consultant to Microptic, uh, where we, uh, we use their SEA system um, for all our CASA analysis. So I'm going to uh, round off now by saying again, thank you very, very much for giving me this uh, excellent opportunity to address you and speak about uh, our interesting work. And uh, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed it. And apologies if uh, it m might have been a little bit too general for some, but I wanted to really address it to a wider audience. I also want to um, express uh, an invitation to you to make contact with our group. Uh, and uh, we have a very nice lab, as I said, um, consisting of probably about 12 researchers at the moment and um, working in, 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 in different fields um, uh, from bee sperm, through penguin sperm, through invertebrate sperm, and through a whole range of mammals, from small ones right up to uh, humans. And so it will be great to have some kind of contact with her. I, I certainly have still good contact with Johanna Schlender, and I hope that will continue for a long time. I thank you very much then for giving me this opportunity. And